Hey there everybody, thanks for joining me for another One Man Review. Today I'll be taking a look at a new Fanagraphics relief, release. This is from their Fanagraphics Underground collection. And this is the Lost Worlds of George Metzger, a collection of the works of uh, underground artist George Metzger. I don't know if this is a complete collection or if this is just indicative work. I don't know if this is all he has done or if this is a first of a volume. I didn't really read the essays about him too much. I got this during the Fanabuck sale and I, I kind of just got this one on a whim. I had some extra credit to spend and this one was coming out so I pre-ordered it with some of my credits. And it was about what I expected. Like it had some really fun ideas, it had some really fun illustrations, but it is like a self-published underground artist. So some of the surface level stuff and some of the structural stuff in terms of rendering humans isn't as great as it could be and it is stuff from like uh, this is 1970 that this was published it was drawn from 67 to 69 this first issue of moondog here and so it has that kind of fantasy element to it uh you know which i knew kind of wasn't really going to be my thing but some of the images just look really fantastical and cool so i got it and that's pretty much what it was there was some stuff that i thought you know it's it's really good self-published indie art but it has like that lack of polish lack of professionalism but then some of the ideas are more compelling than you would get in things going on in the mainstream so the first story here is moondog this is the old man curator Smith and his daughter Priority Smith are in this and they're going this this is the the old man here and they're going to meet this character Moondog. The whole story of the Moondog world is interesting. It's a kind of post-apocalyptic post-global warming like melt event that causes the world to flood so basically it crashes society and puts us back uh, quite a ways and it puts us back into a steampunk world everything's steam powered in so it's really interesting because it is something from 1970 and it's reaching steampunk uh, rather than as like an alternate universe where things haven't passed past steam engine technology in in this world we have had like the electric rev revolution and everything that it's brought but uh things go wrong and put us back into a kind of futuristic steampunk post-apocalypse, which I think is an interesting take on it. One thing that I really appreciate about Metzger's art, I think the thing I appreciate about it most is he's a really good designer and part of his really good design sense is in how he uses the tones. He uses many, many, many different types of tone patterns, different densities, different darknesses and lightnesses. And he's really able to design graphically compelling compositions throughout the pages, even though some of the figures are a little wonky or some of the inkings like a little clunky to my eyes. The, the compositions and what's done with tone throughout, like here, all of this is really compelling and the really constant choices of different patterns, different densities, like here's ones that circle out. And he he and a couple other people in, in the last few weeks have been turning me on to the idea, just looking at it and paying more attention to the effects that they give, turn me on to the idea of um, why I like tones in manga better than say like something like Walking Dead, which has it's all just gray still, but I would have preferred to see it as tones. There's an optical kind of illusion that goes with the tones that makes them sparkle and makes it look a little bit more alive. So I've been paying a lot more attention to the optical illusion extra bit of like glitter and effects that the tones can have on your eyes. And I think Metzger is really intentionally using those type of optical effects that come with the tones throughout this book. So I really, really, really appreciated that. The people in the story are on the way to see how much of California remains since its collapse into the sea during the cataclysmic fall of man. So that gives you a sense of like the type of post-apocalypse we're looking at where the landscape has radically changed worldwide. 
In issue two, you can see some of the steam steampunk vibes coming in a little bit more. So these almost like carny looking put together wooden vehicles that are powered by these steam engines in the front gives you a sense of the type of visual world building that's going on in the Moondog stories. There's actually a sequence where there's some machine men coming in from the past. So you see that before this catastrophic event happened, they had reached uh, general AI. They had robots and things like that. This page also gives you a really good sense of that compositional impact that I'm talking about. When you get images like this, there's absolutely nothing to complain about about Metzger's work. This is awesome stuff. This, there's a pattern here that I don't think I've ever seen anyone else use that I think is, again, does a really awesome job with an optical illusion. I'm going to try and hunt that down and use it. Metzger's doing a really interesting thing with the lighter version of it here where he's going out and erasing. It's like a circular pattern and then he's erasing the middle of certain dots to create a glow and an electric field. Um, totally going to steal that technique. I think it's beautiful. And then some of the really awesome like abstractions he's getting down here out of zooming in on these pieces of technology and then applying a different tone pattern in each one of them. It becomes very pop art Lichtenstein. You can see like this feedback loop now where uh, comics have influenced the fine arts and now the fine arts are influencing comics back. And I think that's really cool to see. You get some more of a sense of how devastating the world is here in issue three. Uh, one of the characters is talking about California as a mythical land beyond the western horizon. And Moondog says, well, California is not a myth to me. And that just struck home personally as well. I, I grew up in California, obviously. And uh, you know, we are very familiar, especially as someone from California who's moved to other places. Moved to New Jersey, moved to Michigan, Virginia. Alabama, almost everywhere I go, people say, why would you move here from California? And I remember having to write an essay about that idea of the, the American dream, the California dream. And it's so funny because I grew up in such a armpit of a place that that was, you know, most of California is not that experience. And so that just hit home for me. Like California is not a myth to me. It's a real place and it's kind of crappy. And I, I just, uh, I think these people have that idea of the mythical California in their mind that they're this, you know, westward bound chasing going on. The reproduction in this book is really, really fantastic. The little bit that I did kind of glance through in the essays uh, made it seem like that George Metzger had all the original art still. So it seems like Fanographics is actually been uh, given a really great gift here in terms of having original artwork, which in a lot of their historical reprints, they don't. And so they're not able to reproduce it as well as they can because they just don't have the resources. In this, everything's really crispy, clear. The tones are impeccably perfect. And one of the things that kind of suggests to me that they really are working directly from the original art still is in some of the tones, you do see a little bit of cracking uh, and shrinking, which I know from working with Sean, like and from listening to him talk about restoring Cerebus, like, a, like this right here, it looks like the tone has cracked and pulled away from itself. Um, so that's, that's an interesting little artifact that I'm not sure would have been in the original art. Maybe I could be wrong, but it suggests to me that beyond, Beyond how nice it looks, it suggests to me that they did have access to most, if not all, of the original art. Which, with all of the tone work that uh, Metzger is doing in here, here's another great example of how he's tiling, piling up tones. Also using a duo shade board, so he's using duo shade and then piling tones on top of it to get a real wide variety of grays and textures. Um, them having access to the original art is awesome because that would have got more ray patterns and would have really screwed with his graphic design aspects. It's really nice to see all that in person. This is another example on, I like this little set of tones here, but this is another example where he went through and scratched out some whites to get like a sparkle effect. And it's, it's really fascinating. I'm, I'm totally going to steal that for bound. Keep an eye out for that.
as the book goes on, it, it moves away from the Moondog stories into a bunch of random stuff, autobiographical stuff, surrealist stuff, uh, you know, a lot of different things in this book. I'm just going to go through and show art and little bits of writing that I like for the rest of the book, just to give you a sense of the variety of what George Messier is doing. Here, I like this bit of writing. In's interest in the ancients led him to read that sacred body of lore, the comic books, and he knows how these beings have survived. Their vital substance is the life spirit of the living. They are vampires. And I like that idea that he has... This, this is still in the Moondog post-apocalypse world, uh, but that our comic books have become the things that you know, we would say like in the Greek gods of the mythology that that wasn't actually, you know, something that was worshipped. It was just popular. I know we have temples to Greek gods and stuff like that, but uh, that a culture could come back and look at this, not just as the stories that we tell, but things that inspired us that we worshipped in a way. And I think that's probably, probably accurate. So I like that quite a bit. This is one of the autobiographical stories. Uh, they're just joking around. Still, I think about the steam power idea. It's weird because some autobiography and the Moondog kind of interweave for a bit uh, because some of the same ideas are coming through. Like George Metzger was obviously someone who liked to live on the road as someone who was living in communes and communities like that. So here you're talking about a community that's like building themselves around those principles within the future story. And uh, they're, they're talking about collecting the methane that comes off from the outhouse and using it to power their steam powered cars. And so they talking about the cars having fart power and you know, just having fun with that idea. Then we move into like the first interspersed section. This is called trucking number one some really actually really nice and as it goes a lot of the landscape renderings especially i like the surface quality quite a bit the pe people still are a little rough for me but compositions again composition and design really really nice work here you can see that this is a, a story about autumn it's autobiographical stuff in in this autobiographical story metzger has a crazy nightmare and he wakes up from it and says that's what i get for reading all those damn comics before going to sleep all the bum things that happen to people in them what a drag bums me out guess that's what's selling bummers what's next shock therapy enough bummer shit in the world without adding more gonna reap what you sow maybe i had to try drawing something positive instead of complaining about others bad trips serves me right if the monsters got me and uh, i've been thinking about that me and tori have been talking about that a lot lately um th that a lot of our media in society and i think someone in the comments someone used the term recently uh like this fear driven media that is all about like these you know big shocking things and explosions and something could always go wrong and you need to be saved and there's just a lot of unhealthy patterns in in the stories we tell and so we've been talking a lot about ways to tell to have healthy entertainment it's not that there's not a lot out there like i just watched the barbie movie and thought that was actually wonderful surprisingly masterpiece of a movie and very positive and, you know, just kind of a different vibe than a lot of the media. And uh, it does, like Metzger's right here, it gets into you in a way, like if you're constantly filling your head with the negativity, it's easier to fall into those patterns. I'm not saying that stuff should be banned. I'm not saying I don't read it. I'm not saying I don't enjoy it. But for me personally, as an artist, I want to make sure that whatever I put out contributes like to people's having a health, healthy worldview if they take anything out of my books. And I like that Metzger's doing that. And it, it also seems like he's reassessing his own, you know, dabbling in sci-fi and all of this. It's like, is there something else? Is there another way? And, and I like that. He seems like a seeking person. Now we back come back to the Moondog. Just a really interesting sequence here where he's going through this... Uh, crack that's been lasered through the mountain and he can basically just ride his motorcycle in it and it's so long and so tall that it forms a weather system inside of it so there's a lot of this world building stuff this fantastical stuff 
these ideas that are really, really compelling throughout this this book. And in kind of the same way that a lot of Brandon's work has those really particular ideas about, you know, a world based on just a few little things that they've altered, spinning out a whole uh, set of other ideas. And, and I'm always in awe of people that do that. And then turning that kind of world into a positive thing. So here we get like kind of an ending to the story. What in the next moment of its life will the sea touch? Shall it lap upon a dead land or embrace anew? That is up to us, you and I, every moment of our lives. And it shows kind of like the dream, I guess, that me and Tori probably have. <laughs> like this little hobbit community. We'd like a little bit more space from our neighbors, but like but it's you can tell that it's technologically integrated as well there's power so you're getting all the benefits of technology they have a radar here so they're still getting entertainment and communication and all of that but it's integrated in the landscape in a healthy way it seems to be designed for humans to be happy giving people space you know a sense of community but also a sense of space people can get further away um just like a real technological village idea and I just had to write there like, yes, please. You know, we've been saying that's where we should be going since the 70s. Uh, it feels very kind of Buckminster Fullery to me. And I don't I don't get it other than greed. I don't know why we're not there, but that's still the goal. Just really like this page, really like the lighting on the page. Again, it gives you a sense of Metzger's power as a composer and his willingness to use lots of different tones throughout to paint the page. This is another page I really just love all the texture and tone work going on. There's this crazy like stipple pattern tone throughout here with some stuff that looks like it may be hand drawn to create all of these patterns. There's the duo shade paper going on. There's, yeah, there's like a kind of washy application to the duo shade. It's just a real variety throughout the book. It's really pleasant to look at. It's a 1973 story, so moving forward in time, just some more uh, views of like the kind of compositions that he's doing, obviously still dealing with the idea of like global warming. He leans at, at a certain point into the myth of Atlantis, which is another one of those just funny moments. Uh, Tori and I re recently watched that. Uh, I forget what it's called. It's the Graham Hancock show on on Netflix where he's talking. He's, he's trying to convince people that there might be an older civilization that was real, that was the real Atlantis that may have existed pre-Ice Age. This story is kind of playing with that same idea. It's showing like the the real Atlantis. You got a lot of cool imagery there. And then dealing in some of the same theories that Graham Hancock is is still selling. It's it's interesting. It's interesting ideas. Um, it would be it'd be fun to follow up more on. In the lettering here, really interesting just way that the eye is drawn. It almost looks like a keyhole, but also like an abstract little person with a head on it. That was probably just because like the le it's not anywhere else in the story, but it is coming from like this special orb. So I'm not sure if that was, it seems 100% intentional that it's like, it's saying eye, but it's also giving a picture of itself, this, this orb thing like it, on top of the pyramid. Uh, it's an in interesting idea. It's a strange visual, and I wish that there would have been more of that kind of stuff to make it not seem like just such a one-off interesting idea, like that could be expanded in the world. At the end of one of these stories, you get the typical, uh, you know, we've all done it, I've done it, the metaphysical pull-out, the fourth wall break, where the story starts talking back to us, and you have George Metzger here arguing with one of his characters and then he just switches over to like okay we'll we'll put you in a different story and then he has a cartoon uh, so i like that as like a curveball imagine if you had a series and you did curved ball for a few issues where the character asked to be changed then you just went in a totally different style for like six months <laughs> that's saw what happened with the readership a lot of fun ideas in here again looking at like science fiction here we have 
like dirigibles, very, very Moebius influence. This is now in 76, I think, so it seems likely that Metzger would have probably been being exposed to some of Moebius's art. So still within the base like structure of everything looking the same, trying different things in terms of application of style, application of the tones and whatnot. Then there are some silent sur surrealist stories that do a lot of fun things with the symbolism. So taking that idea that I said that I wish there was more of in that previous story and really getting more experimental with it. So it's fun to watch an artist like take those little tricks like, oh, I did it once. And then they but, like sat there and ruminated on what else they could do with it. And you see that show up. I think that's really cool. These abstract stories, these surrealist stories, let Metzger lean into the abstraction of his compositions, lets him make things like this that almost like you could see a take this out and do a poetics of form type of comic, which is almost what's going on in here. This is very like the Carl Sagan video where you just infinitely zoom macro, micro, macro, micro back and forth through the universe and multiverse a number of times. Uh, you could see like a contemporary artist like Nicholas Nade doing art exactly like this with tones. And so this really is like this nugget of, man, you were so far ahead of your time. But it's embedded in these more like, you know, you're of your time with like sci-fi fanzine type of art. So really interesting mix. You can see more of that super sophisticated composition here. This is a different kind of silent story where you have an alien language in it. Some parody work, so Star Rats, No Ducks. Star Rats is courtesy of Wing Satire Magazine. You see a very, very different style here, very cartoony style. There's a much later autobiographical piece about going to a comic book convention, and there's definitely some real artists named in here. So you get pros, the real thing. This con had a lady cartoonist who was full of energy and always on the go. Um, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, I, based on the drawing, it kind of looks like my memory of drawings of Trina Robbins, but I'm not sure who that is. So if anyone knows who that is, I'd love to know. Uh, then it, he mentions a superhero artist who was taller than the scripts he works from and on the name tag, he has Steve Leola. So I know that's a, a real cartoonist. And then plus a group of new wave cartoonists, the kind who draw milkmen and weird looking characters. They were normal looking. I crashed their beer bash by drawing left handed. So these are also all real cartoonists. And I would be very like excited if people could figure out who they are. This person says beer drinking guy and the shirt says Big Seattle. Uh, this character just says BC. That looks like it says Carol, Peter, Zuzi, me, and Boz patches on elbow and beer. So I don't know who these people are, but it, these are all people who would have been, I don't know, like in 1986. So probably that early Fanagraphics crowd. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting peek uh, into some, in, into our history from someone who's a part of it, but obviously kind of an outsider, which makes it even more compelling. Also in this book, there's some art that was never published. So when they got a hold of all the original art that they were using to make this restored version with, there was some lost art, some things that people had heard about, but never seen it. And you can see that some of this stuff is really some of his most beautiful, compositionally compelling work. I mean, these are really just killer. And this whole composition there, that's all looks like it's hand drawn. Really awesome, amazing stuff in there. And then there are some color reproductions of the covers for these magazines. And you get to see his just absolutely wild psychedelic colors that he uses in a lot of his covers. And these are also really, really well reproduced where the, the tones and everything are nice and crisp. Maybe could have been sharpened a little. They look a little bit fuzzy. But yeah, it, it seems like a really complete collection 
of a person's career, someone who was operating for quite a while from, you know, the late 60s into the late 80s, like a 20 year career, someone who's probably coming in and out of the industry and coming back after time off and stuff like that. So not the best thing I've ever read, but I think it's a really interesting piece of history. I think there's a lot of really fascinating images in here in terms of design that are inspiring to me. And a lot of the use of the tone is really inspiring to me. The stories, the, the more sci-fi stuff's not exactly done in a way that makes it compelling to me. The autobio stuff's actually pretty compelling. So I think people's enjoyment of this book will be based a little bit just on their genre preferences as well. But I think it's a really cool package. I'm glad that Fantagraphics like, got the rights to this stuff and put it out. It's definitely something that's worth having on the record in a really nice form. House on Fire by Matt Battaglia is a just gorgeous book where Matt's kind of making an emotional response to the, the years of COVID and wrapping that into a sci-fi dystopian future that really the sci-fi dystopians backgrounded and you're fo focused on the emotional journey of two characters in a really beautiful way. And then that's enhanced by Matt's like really awesome, loose, kind of Paul Popish um, dry brush work. And then Sean and Matt have worked to get this second kind of orange spot color in there that's going to look really, really beautiful and has allowed Matt to use his dry brush technique to add tone to the thing too. So um, with Sean's production technique, this is going to be a gorgeous book with a lot of heart.